This is Rollin Kearns interviewing Mr. Henry E. Roberts of Pawnee, Oklahoma. Uh, as I understand it, Mr. Roberts is a full-blood Indian, and he will uh, start out by reading a resume of his experiences. This little theme of mine is relative to the Pawnee Indian tribe of Oklahoma. My name is Henry E. Roberts, age 83, chief of the Skeety Wolf Band of the Pawnee tribe. I am a full-blood Pawnee member of the said Pawnee tribe. My father was Rush Roberts, who was the principal chief of the Skeety Band of the, at the time of his death on March 10th, 1958, at the ripe age of 98. My father was also a full-blood member of the Pawnee tribe. Born in the Nebraska Territory on March 30th, 1859, and migrated with the tribe the tribe's removal from Nebraska to the then Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, between the years of 1874 and 1876. The tribe's removal to Indian Territory was provided in the Treaty of 1857 with the United States government concluded in the state of Nebraska. The Pawnee tribe consisted, consisted of four distinct bands, namely the Skeedy, Chawi, Pitahawirat, and Kitkahawki. The Skeedy band had a slightly different dialect from the other three bands and was the largest band. The Pawnee tribe bought and paid for its tribal reservation in Oklahoma from the Cherokee Nation, covering the greatest portion, and from the Creek Nation, covering the lesser portion. The original Pawnee reservation in Oklahoma was bordered on the north and northeast by the Arkansas River, and on the south by the Cimarron River. In the fall of the year 1893, every living enrolled member was allotted a tract of land from their tribal reservation. Some of the members were allotted 160 acres, others 120 acres, and still others, 80 acres. The remaining unallotted portion of the Pawnee Tribal Reservation was later sold by the Pawnee Tribe to the United States government for $1.25 per acre and was open for homestead settlement to American citizens in the so-called Cherokee Strip land run. And or each homesteader receiving 160 acres of land. Under treaty obligations with the Indian tribe, the United States government maintains an agency administrative office in Pawnee, Oklahoma to uh, supervise the various activities 
on Indian land allotments that are still under federal trusteeship and for other purposes for the benefit of the Pawnee tribe. The Pawnee tribe Well, the Pawnee Tribal Reserve lands, which lie east, which lie adjacent to the city of Pawnee on the east, were never sold or alienated to the United States. But today is held under federal trusteeship of the United States government for the uh, use and benefit of the Pawnee tribe and is the only tribal land presently owned by the Pawnee tribe. The Pawnee tribe as a whole is fairly progressive. Many of the younger and better educated Pawnees are today holding better paying positions, responsible positions, away from Pawnee where better positions are available. While most of the elder Pawnees of retirement age remain at or near Pawnee, the Pawnee tribe as of today numbers approximately a little more than 2,000 souls and the tribe is on the increase population-wise. This concludes my brief offhand history of the Pawnee Indian tribe as I know the facts to be. Mr. Roberts, that's a very interesting resume and the history of the Pawnee tribe. I was wondering if you could give us some of your uh, reminiscences uh, of your association with Jim Thorpe when you went to Carlisle. To begin with, I might say that uh, I first met and knew Jim Thorpe at the Haskell Indian Institute at Lawrence, Kansas. As I remember fairly well, we were about 13 or 14 years old. And of course, Jim hadn't got into that uh, uh, well-known athletics like he did la in later years. And I, never did I suspect that he would. But uh, I was glad that I had met Jim that early in life. And uh, it was uh, several years before I met Jim again, this time at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, the Indian school there. And uh, it was in the fall of the year 1911. And we played together as teammates on the Carlisle varsity football team of 1911. Jim played the position of left halfback I played the position of left end. And uh, back in those days, Carlisle had put a strenuous schedules, 12 to 13 games a season, and uh, some of the best teams in the East at that time. Most of the football world was in the East those days. And among other teams we played in 1911 was with Harvard University. I remember very well we played Harvard at the stadium, the Harvard Stadium at Cambridge. 
uh, another name uh, similar near the Brookline, Massachusetts. And it was lucky that Carlisle won that game, a hard-fought game, one of the hardest games that I ever played in football. The score was close, 18 to 15 in favor of Carlisle. But it was like winning the game 100 to 1, maybe, the way I felt. That's very interesting. Uh, I um, played a little football in the East myself a few years later, but I'm not nearly as tall a man as you are. What are you, about 6 or 6'1"? Six about around 6 feet. Six Six feet. Well, that's uh, about uh, four or five inches taller than I am, so you had a little more reach on catching those passes than I did. <laughs> uh, do you have any um, experiences while you were um, here at Pony after your people migrated here that you think would be interesting? Yes, sir. That, when I uh, came back to Pony, after my schooling, I did some uh, work in the Federal Indian Service. I did a few years' work right here at Pawnee and at various other places, at Muskogee, up in South Dakota, in Wyoming. You might say I was just everywhere. And uh, still later yet, I uh, joined the uh, United States Atomic Energy Commission at Los Alamos about the time that they were making that first bomb. I went there and uh, stayed there for a matter of five years. I was, I was not a scientist or anything like that, but I was in the, uh, in the uh, financial department of the AEC. And then our section was transferred later to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where a regional office was created by the government and uh, I stayed there until I retired in 1958 at the age of 70. Now, uh, well... That's quite interesting, and you strike a good many uh, harmonious chords with me. I was also born in Nebraska, and I lived for a good many years at Muskogee, and I was secretary of the Southwest Atomic Energy Associates until I retired here some two years ago myself. I wonder if, um, uh, by any chance, if your wife is full-blood Indian. My wife and I, I might say at the outset, will celebrate our 60th anniversary on the 15th of January, 1972. And by the way, we were married at Carlisle. And we have uh, four children living today, all of whom are well employed. Most of them are in the federal service out in in the West, uh, southwestern states, mm -hmm. New Mexico, and one of the boys in California. And uh, as I say, my wife and I married at Carlisle. She is a half-blood. Chippewa Indian from the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I guess people would wonder how two people coming from different parts of the United States ever met anywhere, but that's where we met was at Carlisle yes. and uh, mm -hmm. got married there and been married ever since. Mm -hmm. That's a record these days, too. <laughs> 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 Why, um, at that time, Carlisle was a 100% Indian school, was it not? It was, yes, sir. It was uh, Carlisle, as many people might not know, was uh, partially industrial, or we'd call it vocational today. Yeah. Partially industrial, part academic. And uh, that way the government uh, made it so that if anybody leaned to the vocational trade and such as that, they could, they could take half a day of, of school day working at a trade, and the other half, academic. Mm -hmm. And well, in fact, all of them had to do that. They had to uh, work at some trade to your liking, and then, of course, the, uh, the academic. Mm -hmm. That's very similar to the plan that the University of Cincinnati uses, except theirs is uh, you go to school six months, and then you go on the job six oh. months. Similar plan. Uh, Ms. Uh, 
Do you suppose your wife would care to say a few words? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to congratulate you on your... You want to say anything, Mama? No, no I better not. I'll let well, him do the... I, I do want to congratulate you on your golden wedding anniversary. Yeah. It's yeah. come up. Oh, yeah, golden. Uh, oh, your 60th. 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 That's 60th. wonderful. Well, that's wonderful. We passed the golden. Yes. Well, I, I have my 45th this month, a week from tomorrow. Mr. Roberts, I wonder if you wouldn't uh, give us a few facts and reminiscences of your father, who was also a very well-known and highly respected man of your race. My father, I mentioned uh, before, but I didn't uh, tell some of the things that I might now tell. He was uh, a Pawnee Indian scout enrolled in the U.S. Army. And uh, the Pawnee Indian Scouts operated in the campaigns in the northern states, Wyoming, the Dakotas, and Nebraska. The, the government wanted them to uh, sort of help in the subduing of the uprisings up there in those days because they were, they having lived in Nebraska themselves, they they knew the country well and were familiar with the tribes there. And uh, the government uh, sent two brothers from, from the north there down to Pawnee, Oklahoma, the North Brothers, as they were called, to, to muster in Pawnee members that wanted to join. Of course, only a certain number could join. And my father tells me that he was about the youngest one to enlist. I think he was about 16 or something like that. And uh, he uh, he went through the campaigns up there and put a, he said, hard, hard camp, hardships. Had to endure cold weather. And of course, the United States Army issued them, they were in the cavalry division, issued them horses, saddles, blankets, and so on. And they did good bit of the campaigning up there at night. It was very cold. He said they'd have to sleep on the ground, but I guess they, they had blankets and things and got along the best they could. And finally, uh, they they were must the Pawnee Scouts were mustered out. And uh, some years later, quite a few years later after they were mustered out, why the United States government passed a law giving those scouts, those that remained, a pension. And my father happened to be living yet, so he so he had a pension for a number of years for his services in the U.S. Army. They were in a cavalry division. And my father lived to be the ripe age of 98. He died here at Pawnee, Oklahoma, although he was born up in the Nebraska Territory. Well known, well thought of by everybody. We were very proud of him. So uh, I, for myself, have tried to follow in his footsteps. Well, I think that's a remarkable story, Mr. Roberts. Uh, you and Ms. Roberts do live here in Pawnee still. Yes, we do we live here in Pawnee. Uh, this, I suppose, would be where you would want to remain the rest of your lives. This is where you would want to stay the rest of your lives. Yes, that's true, because we have, uh, we still have some of our land holdings, that is me. My wife, being a member of the Chippewa tribe, has land holdings up, up in the state of Wisconsin. But, uh, she likes this climate here, Oklahoma, so we made our home here and intend to stay here. Well, I think that's fine. I certainly would prefer this to that rigorous Wisconsin climate. Mr. Roberts, would you mind telling us a little bit about your uh, uh, remaining family, your brothers and sisters? I have um, three sisters and two brothers. The oldest sister is past 84 and I'm next to her 
I'm past 83. And my other sister will soon, right soon, be 80 years old. We're grouped together pretty closely on age. They were here recently on a visit at our home and spent quite a little time with us. And I guess one of my sisters, the one that lived out in New Mexico, realized that we were getting old. So she made up her mind while she was here that she was going to move back to Pawnee. And she's recently bought a home here. She's probably on her way here now from New Mexico. My the, the sister, the other sister, the oldest one, was a resident of Pahaska, Oklahoma. She had a home there, and I, from what I gather here, she's fixing to sell that home there, and she's coming here to Pawnee to live with this other sister who has bought the home here. Now I have two other, uh, three other brothers and sisters. One is a girl, the other are two boys. George, a brother of mine, lives here on a farm near Pawnee. And one of the other boy, he's presently employed with uh, an aircraft corporation in Fort Worth, Texas. And the younger sister recently retired from the federal service, and she has a home here in Pawnee near where we live. So we, uh, we're all together, maybe grouped together pretty closely in our, in our waiting years. You might say a family consolidation. Yes, sir. Mr. Roberts, I'm uh, curious as to uh, how you uh, have come up with the name of Roberts, being a full-blood Indian. They're used uh, to be in all the books I've read. They were named after uh, animals like Little Bear or something like that. Would you care to comment on that? A good question you've raised. And uh, as well as I know how my father got the name of Roberts, would like many other Indians got their names. This was uh, while the tribe was up in the state of Nebraska. In the early days, the federal government sent out teachers and so on amongst the Indian tribes to try to educate them, you know. They created schools for the Indians, and, and I understand that some of those teachers and other workers amongst the Indians named some of the children after their name. Well, I do not know positively, I gather that that's the way my father got his name. Somebody named Roberts must have been amongst the Pawnees in the early days, probably as teacher or something like that. He gave my father the name of Roberts. My father, you see, had had an Indian name, uh, which, which which was more appropriate to the uh, full blood Indian. But he got the, he had he finally had an Indian name and an English name. So well. He kept the name of Roberts, but with reference to uh, Indian names, there are more or less changes through the years. As a man grew from childhood to manhood, maybe there'd be two, three times he'd get a new name. That's what happened to my father. I knew what his, what his name was when he died. Uh, translated, his name, Indian name was uh, Fancy Eagle. I'll pronounce it for you, but you can't write it out unless you write it phonetically. <laughs> That the uh, gods deweeted at uh, no, pardon me, no, that's my name. My father's name was Rita Gods Karahar. That means Rita Gods means eagle, Karahara means fancy or proud eagle, either way you want to make it. But they translated as fancy eagle. Is that in the Pawnee language you're speaking? That is in the Pawnee language. And it's my name my name, my Indian name was uh, is even now. That means City Eagle. And my dad tells me that that was the name of his grandfather. That's customary to hand names down after the original one has passed on. Mm -hmm. They passed the, one, the name down to some younger, a younger member, you know. So I have my great-grandfather's name, City Eagle. Mm -hmm. Rita Gottstewetit. Your language is very beautiful, and it is just enough guttural to re resembled uh, German quite a bit, did you? That is right. Mr. Roberts, I just wondered if you were uh, well acquainted with Pony Bill and if you have any reminiscences with respect to him. Now, as to being well acquainted with Pony Bill, I, I must say that I wasn't too well acquainted because I was somewhat younger than him, but uh, 
I will say this, I knew Pawnee Bill. I used to see him quite often on the streets here in Pawnee when I was a young lad. And uh, of course, everybody knew him. He, he wore his hair kind of long, hanging over his shoulders. He usually wore a Western style hat and he usually wore boots and well-dressed always. He wasn't a large man, he was a small man rather, but always looked neat. And uh, I think I can safely say that I even knew his parents. Right there, his parents lived right here in the city of Pawnee one time. Yeah. They were they were old, and I used to see Pawnee Bill's father out in the yard there where they lived. I didn't I didn't get to see the the mother so much, but she was living I'm sure, and she was living in in the home there with his father. And Pawnee Bill's father used to sort of tend to Pawnee Bill's buffaloes when he began to acquire the buffalo, mm -hmm. and it seemed like it. Uh, the buffaloes, I understand, knew him pretty well. They wouldn't, they wouldn't hardly bother me to go around amongst them and feed them, you know. Actually, you'd never think it. Of course, they were wild beasts, but then I guess they were sort of tame. They knew him, and he used to kind of look after them when they started his herd, you know. Have, have you ever eaten any buffalo meat yourself? I sure have. I've, uh, I've eaten some of the meat that uh, Pawnee Bill uh, the meat that he had uh, from his butchering. It used to be customary, I understand, that uh, along the holidays time, long Thanksgiving and Christmas time, he'd butcher some of his buffalo, mm -hmm. and uh, he'd send he'd send some some of the meat cuts to his friends in the east, I understand, and then. Most always, he always put one or two in the local markets. We had local markets here that had meat cutters, mm -hmm. and it was, all, it was on sale. So one time, I, I learned that there was some buffalo meat on sale. I think I bought a roast. It was a roast. It was a kind of a dark-looking meat, a little coarser than the, our uh, beef cattle meat. And But my wife cooked it. It was all right. I didn't see anything wrong with it. I uh, interviewed a man this morning and said it's about as near to beef as any meat that he knows of. It is, it is. It's about as near to beef, yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I couldn't see much difference. She cooked it as a roast and that meat was fine. Mm -hmm. Mr. Roberts, since you retired, uh, how do you spend your time? Since I retired in 1958 and came back to our hometown of Pawnee, I uh, I have not engaged in any remunerative remunerative uh, compensation of a kind. Just staying at home, but I have a hobby of growing flowers and and uh, tending a garden. We have a little garden plot at home there, and I enjoy planting different things in that garden plot and tending the tending those things more to keep me ac activated. We don't raise anything to sell. What we do get, if we're lucky to get a thing, we eat ourselves, maybe give some to our nearby friends. But it's mostly to keep me activated, and although I'm going on 84 years now in age, I st still feel pretty good. I went to the, I went to the hospital the other day, and the doctor took my blood pressure, and he looked at it. He told me, he told me what it was. He says, he says, you have nothing to worry about, he says. That's what he told me. Well, I think that's wonderful, and I'm sure that Ms. Roberts does, too. Uh, well, Ms. Roberts, after having lived with this man for 60 years, do you have any comments as to uh, whether you'd want to do it all over again or not? No, I wouldn't miss it for anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, had a very happy life. That's about as good a yeah. testimony as uh, any man could ask from a wife of 60 years. Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah, Mr. Roberts, um, I understand they're planning some kind of celebration for you and Ms. Roberts, and also maybe something just on your account, and I wonder if you could tell us something about that, and also dwell a little more on that 19, 8, 9, 10, and 11 team of yours. All right, I'll, I'll refer back first to Carlisle. I've, I've been told recently from pretty good authority that uh, I am the only living teammate 
of the great athlete Jim Thorpe or that played on the 19-11 season team at Carlisle. I suppose that's true. I have no way of keeping in touch with my teammates at that time. Many of them I know have passed on. And of course, Jim has been dead for a number of years. Uh, we'll switch to the other. <clears throat> Prior to going to Carlisle, I went to school at the Haskell Indian Institute at Lawrence, Kansas. And during the years of 1908 and 9, particularly, I, uh, I took uh, business administration there. And while there, I played uh, college football for the Haskell Indian team. And our, we, had a, a, we had a very successful season during the season of 1909. Our coach was a Nebraska. We had a, a we had a very successful season during the season of 1909. Our coach was a Nebraska graduate, Bedner his name was. He was a noted player at one time at the uh, University of Nebraska. Very good coach. And uh, during the season of 1909, we had quite a schedule. And, I remember we played the University of Texas down in Dallas during the state fair, and we were lucky to beat Dallas by uh, Texas by one point. Oh. It just happened that uh, I was I was I did all the kicking for the Haskell team on that for that year, and it fell to my point or fell to my lot to uh, kick that extra point in order to win the game from Texas. And luckily, some way, well, I got that ball over the crossbar. It was a place kick. And we won 11 and 12 from the University of Texas. Well, I'm always glad to hear of anybody beating Texas, especially <laughs> at school. Uh, I wonder if um, you could tell us a little more about this celebration that's being planned. Or, yeah, they're planning a big uh, yeah. Could you give us celebration for us? With regard to our upcoming 60th anniversary of our marriage. I have been told that uh, that something is planned for that event, if we reach that event. And of course, uh, our children kind of want to plan something themselves. Maybe they'll all come home and be with us to celebrate the 60th anniversary. Just what will transpire, I do not know, but I understand that something is on foot uh, elsewhere locally, as I've been told. And that will transpire or develop a little later as we get to the anniversary date of January 15, 1972. Mr. Roberts, I think that uh, things have changed somewhat since uh, 1908, 1909, 10, 11, when you were playing, especially in the a uh, matter of uh, equipment that the players wore and the uh, rules of the game. Would you care to comment any on that? Yes, uh, <clears throat> I would say that the the paraphernalia or football equipment that uh, they have today is very much different from what we had when we played way back in there in the early 1900s. We uh, the, the player of today is much better protected in every way, around the shoulders, around the loins, around the legs and ankles, and especially the headgears. Back in our days, we just had a little, little padded headgear, well. padded on top and maybe padded around the ears there with a hole so he could hear, <laughs> a little strap around, under the chin had to hold on, but now they have Pretty massive uh, headgears. It's hard to penetrate. Or anything. We didn't have anything like that, and they have better shoulder pads. We didn't have anything to protect the loins those days. And uh, while we had shin guards, yet we we very seldom use shin guards because the Indian the Indian school teams, as a rule, were always outweighed by the by the adversary, mm -hmm. and we had to depend good bit on speed, not put on too much clothing, you know, had to depend on speed and uh, trickery, you might say. 
So uh, we had pretty good shoes, but the cleats on shoes now are different from what they used to be. They even have mud cleats now, which yeah. didn't even yeah. exist in the days of cheap flight. Muddy ground and for dry ground, different, you know. That's right. Well, Mr. Roberts, uh, do you have any uh, concluding remarks to make? I understand that you have a few things you might say about Nebraska, which is our joint native land. Could I mention your name? Sure. Well, Mr. Carnes, you just told me that you were a Nebraskan. And I might say that uh, while I attended the Haskell Indian Institute at Lawrence, Kansas, I played football there for a couple of years, seasons of 1908 and 9. And uh, the season of 1909, we played the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And I said before, uh, our coach at that time was, was a Nebraskan, Coach Bender, we called him. And uh, we played on a muddy field on the uh, Nebraska campus, uh, it was just a new field that they had created, and it had rained about a week then. We played in mud almost ankle deep. And although Nebraska team outweighed our team, I can't figure out yet how we ever won, having a much lighter team. Must be that the Nebraskans were so heavy they couldn't get round in that mud there, but somehow <laughs> we won a close game there. I think the score was about... Uh, well, it, it wasn't a high score, it was a close score, and about one or two points difference. But I always have a warm heart for Nebraska because uh, my ancestors came from Nebraska. Well, I think that's mighty fine. Incidentally, this has been a most interesting uh, interview, Mr. Roberts and Ms. Roberts, and this is Roland Kearns concluding the interview with Mr. Roberts on uh, September 15th, 1971. This is Penn Woods.